God, we thank you for a new day, a new opportunity. His mercies are renewed every day, and we have this opportunity one more time to be in his house. Can we just lift our voices to him? Lord, we love you. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, you are great and greatly to be praised. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to be in your house of worship, Lord, one more time. Help us, Lord, take full advantage of every second that we have in this house, dear Lord, to proclaim you, to worship you, to magnify you, to allow you, Lord, to change us, change our minds, change our hearts. Touch us today. Minister to us today through music, through your word, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. There's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. But that power came through sacrifice. And there is still power in the blood of Jesus. So how many of you believe that this morning? There's power in the blood. Amen. And we are here because of that power. So let's worship this morning as they sing. house this morning. This feels like a Pentecostal church on a Sunday morning. Amen. I hope so. Me too. I expected nothing less. So we'll go ahead. I want to get started because uh, today we're going to talk about Christian culture 
And uh, I've got 30 minutes, and there's just no way we can cover it all in 30 minutes. So I want to jump right into it. I want to thank Pastor for allowing me this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I also just want to give a short disclaimer because I know this is being videotaped. It's going to be shared online, Facebook, social media. Um, At my job, I am the assistant dean of student initiatives. And uh, a couple of months ago, I was elected as the co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee. And so it's my job to help and make sure that students, regardless of their culture, race, things like that, have an equal opportunity to participate in a college education. Now, that's the world's culture where we operate, and it's an American value, and I think it's even a Christian value, equal opportunity for all. But today, we're not going to be talking about worldly culture. Today, we're going to be talking about Christian culture. So I want to be clear that what I do there does not impact what I do here. This, this is an eternal calling in an eternal culture, and I don't want anybody to get it twisted today that they're separate things. All right, so let's, let's talk about Christian culture. Last week, and I'll let you sit down in just a second, last week we discussed that Christian culture can't be understood with a carnal mind. I think we clearly demonstrated that you have to have a spiritual mind to understand Christian culture. And so today we're going to talk about what are some of the aspects of that Christian culture. So hopefully you come in with a a spiritual mind and not a carnal mind so we can understand these things. So I'm going to read my scripture text. If you could direct your attention to Colossians 3 and 17. That just feels good in the house today. I'm excited. Colossians 3 and 17. And it says, And whatsoever you do in word or deed... And that pretty much covers everything we do. Things we speak, things we do. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Today we're going to talk just for a few minutes about conspicuous Christian culture. Why don't you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your presence in this house, God. Thank you for the joy and the excitement that we feel. Lord, I ask you to touch us today, God. Remind us of the wonderful bounty that comes with living for you today, God. Lord, the peace and the joy and the Holy Ghost that comes from being included in Christian culture, God. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to be partakers of your wonders, Lord. Bless us today, God. Speak to us. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. So there's just absolutely no way we can talk about all aspects of Christian culture or any culture in in 30 or 35 minutes. So we're just going to talk about conspicuous culture. And if you don't know what that means, conspicuous just means readily noticeable. Those things that you're going to see on first blush. If you just quickly looked at me, you would say he's wearing a blue suit and a green tie. Right? That's, That's very conspicuous. It's even more conspicuous when I had on my yellow tie. But green's a little bit more subdued today. And last week, we heard the heartbreaking story of Fatma and her daughter and how they were subjected to torture, female genital mutilation because of their culture. And unfortunately, that harrowing story is not the only example of practices in worldly cultures that are just not conducive to Christian culture. Um, Body modifications like that are fairly common outside of Christianity. Um, And they're usually related to religious practices. People usually do these for religious reasons uh, or coming-of-age celebrations. A couple of them that are very noticeable and uh, prime examples, ear stretching. You may have seen ear stretching in some cultures. Uh, It became popular here in the United States back in the early 2000s. People in the counterculture movement started to wear, we call them gauges in their ears, and they would stretch their ears. But that practice dates back to ancient Egypt, anthropologists tell us. And they believe that it was a sign of belonging, that you belong to the tribe. It marked a person as one of us. It was a way to say that I belong to the Egyptian culture and all the cultures that came after that. Uh, in a similar vein, lip stretching. Have you seen lip stretching? Now, I'm not picking on indigenous tribes because these are two practices that are now being practiced in America by our young people. Uh, Lip stretching, it started with the ears. A couple years later, I saw read an article, a young man was proud. He thought he was the first 
uh, person in modern American culture to start lip stretching, and he's doing that. And uh, we're not sure where that comes from. Archaeologists and anthropologists have looked, and they said that it predates ancient Egyptian culture. It predates the time of Christ by several thousand years. Uh, they are not sure why tribes started using it. Some believe that it was a way to make the females less attractive so slave traders would not come and take them. Um, some people don't believe that. Others believe that it was a way to make the women more attractive. Um, but there are, even in this day, several tribes that still use lip stretching. And we do know why they use it. They use it as a sign of belonging, once again, to a tribe. And... It's not just saying that I belong to these tribes, but it also directly affects the dowry that is paid to the family when these young women are married. So around 15 or 16, they stick a spike through their lip, and they plug it with a piece of wood, and then they eventually start to grow it and grow it and grow it. And when it's time for these young women to be married, the size of their lip plate will dictate how many cattle their family can receive. So if you have a small lip plate, around 40 cattle, and if you have a large lip plate, it's around 60 cattle. And so it is a sign of belonging. And I just can't help but think about what these people are going through to show they belong. And I'm reminded that Jesus told us in John 13, 35, he says, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. You don't have to modify your body. You don't have to pierce yourself. He said, you just got to love one another. He said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. I'm, I'm thankful that when we identify with Christian culture, we don't have to go through a painful process. we just really got to die out to ourselves and love one another. Now, I don't want to get too hung up on body modifications. I feel like some preachers like that because it's an easy visual example. But there are plenty of other practices in worldly culture that have no place in Christian culture. Uh, there's a tribe down uh, the Amazon rainforest. They, they dwell on the border near Amazon, uh, Brazil and Venezuela. And they believe that once a person dies, no part of their body should remain. So if you lose a loved one, they'll take, and I'm not trying to be graphic, but they'll take and they burn the body. And after the body is burned, there will be some bone fragments and the ashes left over. And they will take that and they will grind it up into a fine powder. And they'll make a soup. And they'll mix the ashes into the soup, and then they feed it to the family. And the belief now is that now that the body is completely gone, that the spirit resides in their family members. But Ecclesiastes, in the Christian culture, Ecclesiastes 12 and 7 tells us, Then shall dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. See, in Christian culture, we don't believe that if you eat the your relative's dead body that their spirit lives in you. We believe all spirits are going to go back to God and one day stand before God in the white throne judgment. And these are extreme examples, but a little bit closer to home, we live in the land of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And uh, for your little bit older people, you may not have heard this, but very popular right now, I hear it freely talked about among my students, is what's called hookup culture. Anybody heard of hookup culture? Some of you are looking at me. It's not a fishing term. <clears throat> um, hookup culture is when young people in this culture promotes casual sex with no intimacy. You don't even have to like the person. No bonding, no committed relationship. They talk about it freely, and it's so popular now because I'm in an education field that universities are starting to put in what are called Plan B vending machines on their campuses. So if you're not familiar with Plan B, Plan B is a contraceptive that you can take up to three days after the act, and it will prevent pregnancy, conception in most cases. And so this hookup culture has become so prevalent now that people think it's necessary to have a vending machine. You, you know, or you used to get potato chips out of, now it's a vending machine. You go, you feed in your, I think it's $8 because it's subsidized, uh, subsidized by the government. You put in your $8 you get a contraception. It's available 24 hours in privacy. Now, I'm not preaching against plan B at all. Um, that's between you and your spouse and God. But what I am preaching against is the culture that makes it necessary to put a vending machine on a campus to get rid of a pregnancy. Hookup culture. And don't be deceived. Your young people are facing that on a daily basis. 
my sixth grader come home and was talking about lewd dances and people taking off their clothes on the bus and at school, just be aware. Be aware. Ephesians 5, 3 tells us about fornication and all uncleanliness and covetousness. covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as become of the saints. Not once, much less hookup culture. So, those are things that don't belong in Christian culture. So what does belong in Christian culture? So today we're briefly going to look at four things. Four, not three. I can count. Muriel will probably correct me. So four things. And first we're going to talk about is fellowship with the body of Christ. Fellowship with the body of Christ. Man was created for communion. Plain and simple. We were created for communion with God. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve walked and they talked with God. But then that was lost. And for years and years and years, the only people that could enter into the presence of God were a few chosen priests that were allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. But, but one day Jesus came and reconciled us unto himself. And, and the veil was rent. And now we can come boldly before the throne of grace. But it's not just a vertical communion that we need. We also need a horizontal communion. Paul makes it clear in his writings that we have to be in support and be members of the body of Christ. That we all are fitly joined together, supporting each other. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. He's saying that you need to come spend time with other saints. You need to be encouraged. You need to be challenged. You need to be taught. You need to teach. We have to have communion and fellowship with each other. That is a cornerstone of the Christian culture. But it's not just two hours on a Sunday morning. That's not enough. right? You've got to, outside of church, make sure that you're hanging out with the right people. It's very important that you have fellowship. If you ever get isolated and lonely and by yourself, that's a dangerous place to be. The devil can play with your mind and your emotions and, and he can wrap you up in shame. And you'll get places you never thought you would go. But when you're in fellowship with God and each other, there's a, there's a, there's a check there. There's encouragement. And this, the early church was a house church. Acts 2.46 says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Fellowship is a cornerstone of Christian culture. All right, let me check my time. Back on track. Stewardship. Number two, stewardship. Stewardship is a hallmark of Christian culture. Merriam Webster defines stewardship as the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. Now, you're probably thinking, I, nobody's entrusted me with anything. It's easy to feel that way sometimes. I've felt at times, what do I have to offer? What do I have to give? But James tells us in 117, he says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variables, variableness, neither shadow of turning. Everything that we have is from God. And it is a cornerstone of Christian culture that we need to be good stewards of those things. Amen? Jesus talks and he used stewards a lot of times in his parables. In Matthew 25, we have the parable of the talents. If you're not familiar with that, I won't read the whole thing, just briefly tell you a story. There was a man who was going on a, on a trip. Obviously, Jesus was talking about he was going to leave us and then come back one day. And he called his servants, or in this case, we can call them stewards. And he said, I'm going to give you some money. And they call them talents there. And to the first one in today's finances, uh, it would be about nine and a half thousand dollars and he said here I need you to take this money and take care of it for me and he called the second one it's about three and a half thousand dollars and he called the third one and gave him about a thousand dollars and he said I'm gonna go and then I'm gonna come back well the first two the one that got the nine thousand the other one got around three thousand they went and invested their money and they doubled it the third guy went and dug a hole in the ground and buried his money so when the master came back, the first two was like, Lord, we invested. We have doubled what you gave us. And the Lord said, very good. Enter in. But the third one said, here, Lord, you gave me a 1,000. I'm just going to give you a 1,000 back. And the Lord, the master, was angry with him. 
Now, I'm going to be honest. When I was a young man and I read this, I was always kind of like, that's a little harsh. I mean, if you gave me $1,000, I wouldn't know how to invest it. I mean, you, you come back, I'd be happy to have a thousand. I'm just glad I didn't spend it on video games or, you know. Uh, that's pretty mean, Lord, because it said he cast him out into outer darkness. But now that I'm a little bit older, I think the, 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 the real thing takeaway here is that the first two knew their master. They knew what he expected. The third guy must not have had a very good relationship with the master because he didn't understand why he was giving him the money. He didn't understand why he was giving him the talents. He didn't know that he expected him to take it and invest it and try to make it better. And I think that shows there was a clear lack of communication between that particular servant and the master. Now, that's a lesson for another day, but each one of us has been in, uh, given and trusted with times and talents and treasures, and we have to be good stewards of those. In terms of money, Christian culture is a tithe-paying culture. I don't know if y'all remember, Brother Ritter told an, taught an excellent set of lessons on tithing last year. Uh, if you've not had a chance to listen to those, I recommend going to the Church of Columbus website, search under social media, and watch those. They're biblically sound, they're illuminating, and if you ever wondered about how we, or why we pay tithes, you'll be blessed, and you'll come away with a better understanding, but we're a tithe-paying culture. We're also a giving culture. Christianity is a giving culture. We give monetary gifts to support those in need. At least I hope we do. God's been dealing with my heart about that recently. That, you know, in all my giving, am I, am I, am I giving to feed the homeless and the orphan and those in jail? But we also give to support the work of God. If you walk down the halls after the church is finished, you'll see all the missionaries that we support. We're a giving church. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says... But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully, that's where I want to be, shall also reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound in every good work. Christian culture is a giving culture. If you uh, are a little bit, uh, well, it's not to be too crass, but a tight wad, if you like to hang on your money a little bit too much, maybe talk to Jesus a little bit and see if you want to give. And you know what? The more you give, the easier it becomes. Uh, my mom gives more freely than anybody I know. Sometimes I think she gives away stuff she shouldn't give away. But she found herself in a predicament a couple years ago. And uh, God gave her a whole house for free. <laughs> so I can't argue. I got all those washing machines and cars and clothes and things that she could have sold and made a little bit of money, she gave them away for free. And in her time of need, God gave her an entire house. You can't outgive God. There's so much more to it, though. True Christian culture does not participate in conspicuous consumption. That's an economic term, and that just means that we buy things that are more expensive or higher quality than what we really need, that we do it for status symbols. And there's nothing wrong with dressing nice, but do we really need a $1,000 suit to come into church on a Sunday morning? Would the $400 suit we were a little bit better than $600 to help someone needy in the community. I recently read that LeBron James has a watch, and this is one of many in his collection, that cost $6.5 million. We're not here to keep up with the Joneses. We're not here to keep up with the Joneses. We're here to minister to the world. Christian culture is not conspicuous culture. We need to be good, good stewards of our time, our talents, and our treasure. Everybody still feeling good? I don't, I don't know about you. This, this, doesn't, this doesn't make me sad. This doesn't make me uncomfortable. This is exciting. This, this is what we embrace. This is what's living for God's all about. This is exciting. Number three, care for the body. Genesis 127 is pretty clear. So God created man in his own image. And then he repeats it, in the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. We are created 
in the image of God. The Christian belief that God created man and created man in his image affects our beliefs on a whole range of topics. Abortion, homosexuality, bioethics, racism, and many more. And if you're wondering why I picked bioethics, did you know I'm familiar with this because it's directly related to the kind of research I do, but do you know now we're to a point where you can go in and you can choose your child's hair color, eye color, even gender? Is that ethical? That's a good question. But we are created in the image of God. And so we sh- I don't think we should be messing with the image of God. If God made us, I think he knew what he was doing. And if you couple that with the New Testament belief that once you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you're the temple of God. So we're created in the image of God and then we receive the Holy Ghost with the temple of God. I think it's pretty clear that we need to take care of our bodies. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? 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 I just see my daughter. Just, you got to be kidding me. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which you have of God, and you are not your own. (laughs) I'm so glad I'm not my own today. I've I've been my own before, and I made a pretty big mess of it. (laughs) Oh, I'm so thankful that thou I got something guiding me and keeping me out of trouble. Mm. Our physical body is made in the image of God, and it is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Not only that, not only... Did he make us in his image? Not only does he live in us, but he purchased us too. Do do you understand that? He made you, and then when you walked away, he came back and bought you back. We have no rights to this anymore. We've been paid for twice over. It belongs to God. Paul continues to say, for you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The body belongs to God. Now, in most cases, when Paul's talking about this, he is speaking about fornication and sexual impurity. In light of what I said about hookup culture, young people, sex is for marriage. Plain and simple. Not before and not with someone besides your spouse outside of marriage. It is for marriage. It's unambiguous. It's very clear. Do not give in to the temptations in the world that comes against you. I know I work in it on a daily basis, and I'm a grown man, happily married, so I can understand the temptations and the things, but you can make it to marriage. You can make it to marriage. Not to embarrass her, but Callie and I made it to marriage. It's possible in this day and time, and God still expects it. Make sure that you're talking to and encouraging your children on the body. Paul tells Timothy, he says, bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that is now is and of that which is to come. I've heard a lot of people use this scripture say, I don't mean, that means I don't have to exercise. That means I don't have to take care of my body because all of that profits little. Be careful. He didn't say it didn't profit anything. He said it profits a little. And he's talking about in in, in terms of eternity, it may be a little thing, but it's still profitable. God still expects you to take care of your body. Uh, We're in a unique place, and i got to quit getting off track here, but uh, because of my research, we're in a unique place in time. For the first time, as far as anybody can tell, obesity is now associated with poverty. Before, obesity was associated with gluttony. But now, the way food prices are, you can get a Big Mac for 99 cents. But if you go to Publix and want a salad, it's 6 or $7. And when you got a family of four or five or six to feed, and they like McDonald's better, and it's not necessarily, I don't want to just be sure when you're looking around, don't be judging people. Because we're in a different time and different circumstances. When it talks about taking care of the body, you should do the best you can. But understand that right now, if you're poor, you're going to be eating unhealthy things. And that's going to lead, for the first time ever, poverty is associated with obesity and not necessarily with gluttony. I'll start teaching a biochemistry class, but we need to move on. Just be patient with your brothers and sisters. Remember those 
body modifications we highlighted earlier. Once you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you are the temple of God. Now, if you've done those things before you come to God, that's past. That's under the blood. You're moving forward. But Christians, be careful. We told you there's, there's this movement right now. There's a spirit of our times that wants us to identify with the cultures of our world. It's asking us to go back and to pick up those things that we've laid down. Be clear that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So why would you go back and begin to modify it and decorate it to take the temple of God and associate it with a carnal culture? Be careful that you're not picking up things to identify the temple of God with carnal cultures. My little two cents there. I don't want to bring us down too much, but be careful in this day and time. In that same vein, Christian culture does not embrace the use of substances that are detrimental to the body. Drugs and other substances that degrade and attack the body are not part of Christian culture. The enemy has come to kill and to steal and to destroy. All those body modifications we talked about, it's destroying It's tearing. It's breaking. It's scarring. It's burning. Drugs and alcohol tears you down, breaks you, destroys you. We are the body of Christ. Ephesians 5 and 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Christian culture values the natural body as God made it and promotes healthy living and lifestyles. Remember, our bodies are not our own. We are stewards of God's property. All right. Number four, this is the last one, godly attire. Christian culture is modest culture. It's modest culture. I think it's very instructive. We started this whole conversation last week on culture by going back and looking at what was in the Garden of Eden, that that idyllic situation that God had made. And Adam and Eve were naked. But they didn't understand good and evil, and and lust was not in the scene, and the, the carnal appetites were not there. As soon as... Their eyes were open. As soon as they had tasted the fruit, what did they do? They went and tried to clothe themselves. And and God came along and said, you're on the right track. You're doing it wrong, but you're on the right track. You do need to be clothed. And he killed an animal and he, he clothed them. And so now, modest attire is part of Christian culture. Now, I've got no intention of pulling out a ruler and talking about how long the hemline or how high the neckline should be. That's not why we're here today. But the spiritual man knows modesty when he sees it. You know how I know that? Because the carnal man knows immodesty when he sees it. I had to tell a story. I may run out of time here. I was in Target the other day, and I was walking out of the store, and there was a young lady younger than my college student, so she must have been a high school student. And uh, I work on a college campus, so uh, when I say she was dressed scandalously, that's a statement. And I was walking out, and I looked up, and my first thought was, whoa, I don't need to be seeing that. But when I turned my eyes, they landed on the gentleman behind her. It was about 10 years older than me, older gentleman, and he had his cell phone. Click, 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 at least until his wife walked up. So if the spiritual mind says that's not what I need to be looking at, we, we should be able to recognize because his carnal mind definitely recognized it carnal culture christian attire so i don't want to get in a lot of this teaching when we start talking about attire goes towards preventing lust i've never been a fan of teaching about dress just to prevent lust that's like telling somebody you should tell the truth just because you don't want to tell a lie how about we tell the truth because god is a god of truth How about we tell the truth because we want to be pleasing to God? How about we tell the truth because we want to be close to God and we want to do the right thing? How about we dress modestly because that's what's pleasing to God? You can do the right thing for the wrong reasons. And God looks at the heart. He knows why you're doing it. But modesty just isn't about covering the body. It's also dressing in a way that does not shift the focus onto the person and away from God. When you walk into the room somewhere, they should feel and see the Holy Ghost on you. 
It should be a testament. There should just, their spirit should automatically be drawn to you. There's something different about them. Young people, have you ever walked into a restaurant and a conversation stopped and they all turn and look at you? It's not because you're weird or you're awkward. It's because you're walking in there with the presence of God and the spirits there are saying, wait a minute. We're in the presence of what we need. And if you're dressing in a way to bring attention to your physical flesh, you can mask or you can cover what God's trying to do. Peter addresses this in his writings, 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5. It says, who's adorning, things we put on, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning, the things that we put on the body, of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of peril. Now, <laughs> I always thought it was funny. He's not dressing against, uh, he's not preaching against wearing clothes. You should wear clothes here. But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, great price. Why is it a great price? Because he paid it. He knows what it costs to give you that spirit. Great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Paul, in the same vein, writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. Timothy was, was training. He was the protege of Paul. And he talks to him. He says, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. So I said Christian culture was modest culture. It's in the word right here. In modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. You don't need a $6 million watch. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. First Timothy, that word adorn is like the trimming of a wick of a candle. So my wife is forever getting on to me when I light candles at our house um, because I don't trim the wick and I come back around the corner and it's puffing little puffs of black smoke and it's not burning like it should. And she'll say, would you cut that candle? So she's, what she's saying is, will you adorn that candle? Will you take and cut off the things that are hindering it from burning as brightly as it can burn? Because it's putting off a smoke and it is stinking and it's messing up the ceiling and it's not doing what it should do because there's just too much junk there. But if you come in and you clip off the excess, then it will burn brighter. It will illuminate better. You're not masking the glow. Adorn. Sometimes we need to cut off those things that are blocking the light of God. God gives us the Holy Ghost to shine as much light as possible. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Why would we take that and cover it up with things that are drawing attention away from the Holy Ghost and to us? That's not Christian culture. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. Let your light so shine before men. Don't cover it up with things that are going to draw attention to you, the physical man, the carnal man. Make sure you're glorifying God, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Covering the light with anything than other, modest, other than modest attire and accoutrements is to cover God's glory and highlight our own glory. I am out of time. Why don't we all stand? I don't know about you, but I think kingdom culture is great. I think it's great. Is it nice to be part of Christian culture? Jesus said, he said, this is the first of all commandments. Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If we get those two taken care of, Christian culture will take care of itself. If we truly get a hold of these scriptures, we'll fully embrace, understand, and exemplify Christian culture. Because in the end, it all comes down 
to pleasing God. Why don't we pray? Lord, thank you, God, for your mercy and your grace, your love and your compassion, God. Thank you for giving us such a clear example of how you want us to live, Lord. God, let it penetrate our hearts. Lord, help us to evaluate ourselves on a daily basis, Lord, to die out and make sure that the things we do are bringing glory to you, Lord. They're pleasing to you, God, and not to us and our flesh. In Jesus' name. Why don't you shake a hand, be friendly as we transition. Amen. Amen. Next week is a very important Sunday. Everyone say Kids Day. It's Kids Day. Brother Ed and Sister Jan Flater and their ministry team are going to be with us ministering here at the church. As Pastor says and as data and st statistics show, 85% of all those who make a decision to serve God do so between the ages of 4 and 14. Amen. 85%. That's a large number, isn't it? It teaches us parents to understand how important it is to have our children in the house of the Lord. Amen. But if we are to reach our world, we must reach our children. We must re reach our kids. Amen. The service next week is vital. It's not just an important service. It's a vital service. It's, it's, it's vitally important, spiritually important to expose our children to services that are specifically for them to ensure that they are ministered to at their level, amen, and their hearts touch with the power and the anointing of God. So it's important to be here next week, amen. They will be not only ministering to our children, but they will also be ministering to us. So let's invite everyone that we know that has children to be in this important service, amen. Say amen. And we say kids day. All right, that's next week, 10 o'clock, excited about that service, uh, looking forward to that. Amen. We'd like to welcome our guests that are visiting with us here today. It is an honor to have you visiting uh, with us. If this is your first time here, would you mind standing just so that we could put a, just to know and recognize you, won't make you say anything. So we have no first time visitors. But if you are here, we would like to welcome you to the Church of Columbus. We pray that you are a that we are a blessing to you as you are to us by being here and worshiping with us this morning. Isn't God a great God? Hey, let's give God a hand clap of praise. Isn't he great? He is so good and so greatly to be praised this morning. Amen. We're going to ask our ushers to come. We're going to take up our morning tithes and offering. And I was reading this uh, story uh, just recently, and uh, it just encourages me that when we do what God asks us to do, he will always, amen, show up and show out. And this story is regarding a, a man who began to trust the Lord, and he started to pay his tithes and offering. And uh, the first thing he did was wrote out a check to the Lord for 10% of his paycheck. And he was really scared to do it. His name was Bob, and he came to church with his check already written out. He had purposed in his heart what he was about to do. And when he saw his friend, he said, you better start praying. By giving this check today, he said, I, I don't know how my family's going to make it this week. And his friend, his friend began to faithfully pray. And he knew that God was going to miraculously provide for his friend. And then on that Thursday night, Bob called this friend and he let him know how God miraculously provided for him. He said when he went to the mailbox on Wednesday, he'd gotten a check from his children's private school saying that they had conducted an audit. And three years ago, the man had overpaid his child's tuition by $138 and a refund was included with the letter. And I want you to know this morning that God will do no less for you. If you sow into the kingdom of God, you tie God to his word, and he's going to begin to do what his word says. He said, if you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God's going to do for you what he did for this man. You know, I had worked for J.C. Penney's for five years. And then about 17 years later, I got a notice in the mail that I had over $5,000 worth of stock options from the company. They wanted to know what I was going to do with it. I smiled. I could not believe that God, out of nowhere, had blessed me with $5,000. 
I want you to know this morning that God loves you just like he loves me. He loves you just like he loved Bob when he gave him that refund check. And we're going to stand this morning. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to thank him as we lift our hearts and begin to thank him for what he's about to do with your offering this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this wonderful opportunity to give uh, to the cause of Jesus Christ. Lord God, everyone that is giving this morning, I pray that God, you would return to them uh, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Lord, we thank you right now for what you're about to pour out on this congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. You may be seated. The Lord bless you abundantly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It still feels good in the house right now. The presence of God is here and he is ready to minister to us. Why don't you stand on your feet and give him his praise right now? Jesus, I love you, Lord. I love you, God. What a great God we serve. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Amos Antoine needs healing from knee surgery. Please remember Sister Stacy McClary's mother. She has had a light stroke and she needs healing in her body. Patty Parker needs healing from cancer. I believe God can do that. I can believe God. Whatever your situation is, God can move. Brother McClary preached it last, last Sunday and it, it's, it just hit me so hard because it's my prayer all the time. It says, a man came to Jesus and he said, Lord, I believe but help my unbelief. God, I believe you can do it. But if there's any doubt in my mind, then take that away too. If that's your prayer today, let's go and pray and for these situations. God, we ask you to reach down in every one of these situations, Lord. Touch Antoine. Touch Sister McClary's mother. Touch Patty, Lord, and let there be a healing in their body, God. A divine intervention, Lord. Give them a testimony, Jesus. Lord, and all across this house, people that have come into this house with needs, with burdens, God. Lord, don't let them walk out of this house the same way they come in, God. Lord, we believe you, but help our unbelief. In Jesus' name.
the days of Ezekiel Dry bones becoming as flesh And these are the days of your servant David Rebuilding a temple of praise Oh, and these are the days of the harvest The fields are as white in your the laborers that are in your vineyard declaring the word Nothing's too hard for him. No God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. No. There's no God like Jehovah. No God. There's no God like Jehovah. Like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. No. There's no God like Jehovah. Nobody. There's no God like Jehovah. No God. Like Jehovah.
Hallelujah. 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 Oh, there is. There is. There is no one. There is no one like Jehovah. Don't let this world fool you. There is no greater power than the power that's in this room right now. There's no greater power. There's no greater anointing that's in this room right now. Our God is a great God. Our God is a redempting God. Our God is a healer. And there's no one, no one like Jehovah. He can take what's wrong and make it right. He can take a disease and he can heal it by a word. He can take a wretched sinner like me. Pull me out of the miry clay. Know my thoughts, know my condition, know what I've been through, know what I've looked at, know what I've said. And he can still reach down and pull me out of a miry clay. Clean me up, fill me with his spirit, uh, and give me a new hope, uh, a new day. Oh, his mercies are new every morning. Amen. I can't think of a better place to be than right here right now because God I'm saying because God is in this place if you need something from the Lord it's here today hallelujah can we just magnify him one more time can we just lift him up and thank him thank you Lord for your presence thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace thank you for your love oh God Thank you for what you are doing in this house. Oh, hallelujah. Isn't God just real? Isn't he just awesome? It's great to be in the presence of God. It's where the presence of the Lord is. Anything. Anything can and will happen. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. It's been a, an honor this weekend to have brother and Sister Miller with us, ministering to our married couples the last couple of days, interacting with him and her. Amen. I just know that their heart and their spirit is right where it needs to be for this church, this moment, this minute, and this hour. God has ministered to us and touched us. Amen. He has a tremendous testimony of the power of God and the redemptive work, amen, of Jesus Christ. Amen. Their marriage is a testimony that there is nothing too hard for God. And it's just an honor to have him with us. He ministers in, at, at Brother Zuniga's church in Goodlettsville, Tennessee. He does marriage uh, seminars. He's been doing that and ministering to married couples for the last 12 years. Amen. And I know he's been a blessing throughout the southeast. And it's just an honor to have him here with us this morning. So let's open our hearts, amen, to what God has in store for us today. Everyone say, God bless Brother Miller as he comes and ministers the word. Oh, come on. Put your hands together for Jesus. Don't you love him this morning? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. Anything is possible in the presence of God. I'm telling you this morning, anything, Brother Don, anything is possible in the house of God. Amen, man. It's so good to be here. So wonderful to be in, in this great church. And wow, we have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed ourselves over the last couple of days and just meeting a lot of you folks and just the fine married couples that were here on Friday night and then yesterday and getting to spend some time with y'all and, and, man, getting to know the Rodriguez's. We've known Jeremy for a while. Uh, Jeremy came to Goodlesville, um, interned at GPC at Goodlesville Pentecostal Church under Brother Zuniga, which is our home church. And uh, so we got to know Jeremy a while back, and it's great to 
get reacquainted, see him again. And uh, we've had a wonderful, wonderful time. Sister Shepherd, a pleasure meeting you this morning, and um, which is great to be. It's an honor to be in you guys' church. And uh, we love the Lord, and I'm not going to spend a t- lot of time getting started here because um, I believe um, that I've heard from the Lord. Let's just lift our hands, and I want us to pray before I even begin. I want us to just open up our hearts and our spirits to what God would say to us this morning. I want him to speak to me as well. This is about all of us, and we're in the presence of God, and God wants to speak to you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you right now. We're in your presence. You've shown yourself strong already in this service today, and we're thankful for it. We're thankful that the power of the Holy Ghost is in this room. We're trusting you. God, I pray that you speak to every one of us, oh God. Let your word be real in our hearts, our minds, our lives. And help us to carry it out into a world that is so shaken, that's so broken, oh God. Help us to carry our story, our testimony into a world that's lost. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God, get Evan out of the way this morning. I pray that you would speak in this place in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. Most of us, I'm sure know the story of David and Goliath. You can read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 17, how the giant Goliath was intimidating the army of Israel, taunting them, harassing them, and no one would fight him because of his great stature. And David, the young shepherd, likely in his teens, because Saul referred to him as a stripling, which was a moving out of adolescence into adulthood. And so David was likely in his teens, and this kid shows up on the battlefield to bring food to his brothers who were fighting in a war. He sees what's going on, and he hears the taunts and the jeers and the offers to fight Goliath with, uh, and he offers, David offers to fight Goliath, and you know the story, with a slingshot. No armor, no sword, no shield, no spear, just a sling and a prayer and a few stones. You know, and I didn't say a wing and a prayer. If you do something on a wing and a prayer, y'all know what that means. If you do something on a wing and a prayer, you're kind of doing it in hopes that you'll succeed, even though you don't have everything you need to succeed. But the difference here is that David had everything he needed. He didn't just hope he would win. He knew he would win because he knew how to use his weapon. He knew how to pray and he knew his God. And so David took Goliath down with a stone to the forehead. He took Goliath's own sword, cut his head off. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they ran. The army of Israel pursued And the Philistines were defeated that day. But what about David's life after Goliath? I want to preach to you for the next little while this morning. Life after Goliath. Life after Goliath. You know, you can look at David's life after Goliath and you can see many highs that happened in his life. Uh, uh, King Saul, the Bible says King Saul was very impressed with with David and the way that David carried himself and the way that he acted and the the wisdom that he showed as a young man. And Saul was very impressed with him and so he put David, the Bible says he put David as a young man, he put him over men of war. And so we read in Scripture, and you can read all of this between chapter 18 and chapter 30 of 1 Samuel. I'm not going to go through all of that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here But Saul puts David over men of war. They begin to go to battle. David begins winning the battles that they are put into. And so the Bible says that David is accepted in the eyes or the sight of all the people. And then it begins to happen that the Bible says the ladies of the cities start to march around singing that David or that Saul has slain his thousands. But David has slain 
his tens of thousands. And so all of these highs that are happening in David's life, and then all of a sudden, Saul wants David killed because he doesn't like the fact. And he says, why are they saying, I've killed my thousands, and David has killed his tens of thousands? And David, or Saul, didn't like that, and so Saul wants David kills. And so, so all of a sudden, you go from these highs to the lows in David's life. And not only does Saul want David killed, so David realizes that the only way he's going to keep from being killed is that he is going to have to flee for his life. And so he leaves. He begins to go on the run with no food, no weapons, all alone. He flees to the city of Nob or the country of Nob. And he goes there to the priest Ahimelech and he had to lie in order to even get some food and to get a weapon. Ahimelech said, why don't you have your weapons if you're going on a, on, a, on a journey that the king has asked you to go on? Why don't you have your weapon? And David said, I had to do it in a hurry. And so uh, the Bible tells us that Ahimelech says, I got one sword here in the temple, and it is the sword that you use to kill Goliath, Goliath's own sword. And so we see David take that sword under the, the premises of a lie, and he runs from there, and he goes to a cave at Adullam. And there at that cave, he's hiding out for his very life. And there at that cave, he's met by about 400 men. And the Bible says that these men were in distress. They were in debt. They were discontent. And they came and they asked David, they said, we want you to be our captain. And so David goes from being a captain over the armies of Saul to being a captain over a bunch of rejects. Warriors, but rejects nonetheless. Then you have the highs of winning battles with his band of brothers, which had now grown to about 600 men. And then you have the lows of still having to flee from Saul, who still wants him dead. And, and so they flee to the land of the Philistines. I've, I've done a little research on this and, and how long that David was in, in uh, that, uh, that time of having to run for his life. And there, there's a lot of speculation a lot of numbers out there, but they say it's pretty easy to figure that was seven or eight years. So seven or eight years of the lows of having to run for his life, but then the highs of being able to battle with his men. Are you seeing a pattern here? Guess what? I want to tell you, and I've, you've, if you hadn't figured it out, you will. There are highs and lows to life. It's just simply called life. You're going to go through some stuff. You're going to deal with some issues. Today might be a great big day. You might go on the job today and everything's great. And you might walk in tomorrow and everything ain't so great. There's highs and lows in life. Back to David. The highs of he goes into the land of the Philistines because he said, Saul won't follow me there. And so the highs in that land of King Achish giving David and his men a town, Ziklag, for their families to live in. And then the lows of being told that they can't fight in a particular battle because they're Jews. And then they go home to Ziklag after being fired from their job on the battlefield only to find their town burned. Not only was Ziklag burned to the ground, but their wives and their sons and their daughters were gone. They were taken captive. You talk about a low. Can you imagine the feeling? And maybe you can to some extent. Maybe you lost your job and then you lost your house. And it seems like one thing after another goes wrong. And you can't seem to see the top for looking up at the bottom. And you cry until you can't cry anymore. Anybody ever been there? Have you ever walked that journey the Bible says in 1 Samuel 30 and verse 4, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. They cried until they couldn't cry anymore because their city was burned and their wives and their kids were all taken captive. Can you imagine what kind of thoughts were going through their minds 
is my wife dead? Are my children dead? Or even worse, what are the attackers possibly doing to my wife and my children? I can imagine that their imaginations were running wild with fear. And then, as if that's not enough, verse 6 says, Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. And so here's David, and he's dealing with the exact same questions and imaginations that all of his men are dealing with, but then all of a sudden, on top of that, his band of brothers all of a sudden want to stone him. Life ain't going too good right now. The victories are behind him. The thrill of defeating Goliath is just a faint memory now. In fact, it's not even something that he can even imagine right at this moment in time. I'm talking about life after Goliath. Have you ever been there? Got this amazing experience of winning the battle over something huge that has kept you down. You've You've defeated your Goliath, and then life happens. Where's the feeling now? Where's God in all of this? Have you ever asked that question? How could God be a part of this? Listen, it's easy to forget the thrill of victory when things seem to be going wrong. Our enemy, Satan, the father of lies, tries to shape our thinking one lie at a time so that we're stuck in this prison believing something that's not true. And that is especially so immediately after a victory. Lies like you can't trust people. You can't let people know the real you. Lies like God doesn't really love you. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't hear your prayer. You're never going to get over it. You're always going to be hurting. Your marriage isn't going to survive. Your kids are going to be lost. You're worthless. You're a loser. You'll never amount to anything. You might as well just give up lies from the enemy. And I can only imagine the thoughts, the lies that are going through the mind of David. In verse 6 again, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved Every man for his sons and his daughters, but, look out, there's a but in this verse, tells me something's about to happen. Let me challenge somebody today, when everything seems to be going wrong, say to yourself, there's a but in here somewhere, something's fixing to go right, because when everything goes wrong, as a child of God, you can count on it. God's about to step in and do something for you. Anybody here ever had a but God experience? I know I have. Messed up thinking, broken, made more mistakes than I could possibly even count. Didn't know how or if I'd come out of the prison in my mind. But God... I should be dead today. I remember wanting to take my own life because I didn't know if I was going to be come, able to come out of my situation. I ought to be dead. But God, my family should have walked away from me 19 and a half years ago. But God, I didn't think I'd ever stand in a pulpit again, Brother Rodriguez. But God, I'm telling you today, God can do anything. It doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter the circumstances that life has thrown in your path. God can and will come through for you. What's your but God experience? The doctor said I had cancer, but God. They're downsizing the company I work at. But God, they said I'd never walk again. But God, my spouse said they wanted a divorce. But God, I was raised in a broken home with an alcoholic father. And everybody thought I'd turn out just like him. But God, I ought to be dead or in prison today. But God. 
Some of you need to look at your situation. You need to look it in the eye and you need to say, wait a minute. I have a sword and I know how to use it. I know how to pray and better than that, I know my God and I know my God is big enough. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters, but David strengthened. He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He strengthened himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. How did he do it? I'll say it again. He knew his God. He knew his God was big enough. He knew his God could take care of every situation. And so he encouraged himself in the Lord. You know what, David, he was, he was quite a ways earlier than the Apostle Paul, so he couldn't take out his Bible and read in 2 Corinthians 10 where the Apostle said to take every thought captive. But I think David had learned to do just that. It looked like everything had gone wrong and this just might be the end. And here he had avoided Saul and God had kept Saul from killing David. He had run and, and run and run until he was exhausted and now this, but David said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm better than this. I refuse to believe the lies. I, be, I refuse to believe the lies of the enemy. So I'm going to just strengthen and encourage myself in the Lord. And I'm telling you, if, it, if David could do it in those circumstances, you can do it in whatever it is you're going through. Mark Batterson in his book, Win the Day, said, if your life isn't what you want it to be, it may be because you're telling yourself the wrong story. You are not the mistakes you've made. You are not the labels put on you by other people. You are who God says you are. And anything less than that is false humility. If you want to change your life, start by changing your story. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, we all know it. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down those imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The NIV says it this way, verse 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Listen to me today. Our weapons have divine power to demolish the lies of the devil. Our weapons have divine power to demolish and to crush strongholds. So what do we do? We take every thought captive and we make it obedient to Christ. The word captive there comes from a Greek word that means to capture, or in, in other words, uh, as an example, a prisoner of war with a sword or a spear. The Apostle Paul also wrote about in Ephesians chapter 6, putting on the whole armor of God. Every piece of that armor is defensive except one, and that is the sword of the Spirit, an offensive weapon, which is the Word of God. Let me challenge you today, use the weapon. Use the weapon. Use the weapon. Use the weapon. It's been given to you for that purpose. You better get a love for this word in your heart. You better get a love for the word of God in your spirit because I'm telling you when you're on the bottom, that word is your strength. I found myself on, I gotta be real careful because I'm looking at the clock too. I got to be real careful, but I'm going to tell you something. When I found myself on the bottom and didn't know how I was going to break some things that had control of my mind and my thinking, I turned to this book. I turned to the Word of God because even as a minister moving forward, back in those days, I didn't have the relationship with the Word of God that I needed to have. But I can tell you, God began to move in my spirit, and I began to pour the Word of God into myself. And this, I love this Word. I love the power that is in the Word of God. 
put it in your heart. Hide it in your mind. And when those thoughts come, I promise you, when you take this word, you can replace any thought the enemy would put in your life. You replace it with the word of God. And there is a strength that comes through the word. And when a thought that begins to argue against the word of God enters into our mind and tries to establish a stronghold, we got to take that sword and put it up against that thought and say, you are not going to take me captive. I'm going to take you captive. We have to take captive every thought and make it obey Jesus Christ. Capture the wrong thoughts. I, I will not go down this negative pathway. This does not lead to God's destination for my life. I am not going, I refuse to go down this destiny or this pathway of lust. This is not God honoring. It's going to mess up my life. It's going to mess up my future. And so from now on, I'm going to choose a different road. And you know what? That old path starts to grow over. It's not appealing anymore. It's not so easy to go down that old path anymore. And the more I travel the pathway of God's truth, the more I believe it, and the more he renews my mind, and the more he changes my thinking, and the more I'm able to walk by faith and not by sight, and the more his spirit guides me and directs me, and the more his power empowers me to do what he called me to do. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As you think, so you become. If you think you can't, guess what? You probably won't. If you believe that through Christ you can do all things, guess what? You will do all things through Christ. If you believe you're a victim always suffering at the hand of some outside circumstance, guess what? You'll live the rest of your life as a victim. If you believe you can overcome through the power of Christ, you will be an overcomer. If you're always looking at the problems, dwelling on the problems, your problems will overwhelm you. But if instead you're looking for solutions, looking for the work of God, you will find solutions and you will find God working in your situation. Here's the deal. Most of life's battles are won or lost right up here. They're lost in our minds, or they're one in our minds. Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the renewing of your mind. Again, when you begin to focus on God's Word and meditate on God's Word and practice God's Word and apply God's Word to your life, you are renewing your mind and you are transformed. You are changed by the renewing of your mind. That means we don't think like the world thinks. That means we don't live like the world lives. But instead, we are instructed to be transformed, to be changed. How are we transformed? By the renewing. The Greek word is anakainosis. There it is, anakainosis. And that word means renovation or complete change for the better. You got a huge renovation going on. You know what? Some of y'all need to walk through the renovation. And you need to see what kind of work is involved in a renovation. And it sounds like we got a job to do. I got to work on my mind, brother. I got to work on my thinking, sisters. I got to work on me. And when I work on me and I allow the Word to envelop my life and my spirit, God will move in and God will work on my behalf. <laughs> Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just, pure, lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Why do you think that verse is in the Bible? I believe God knew the battle we'd have in our thoughts and how easy it would be to put our focus on the negative and worry and fear. And he also knew the freedom we'd possess if we would simply practice thinking like that verse says to think. And then Paul wrote in the very next verse, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with it. Just do it. Nike ain't got nothing on Paul. Just do it. 
Your life's always moving in the direction of your strongest thought. Are your strongest thoughts fear? You need to quote the book. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. Is it negativity? No matter what I do, I fail. I can do all things through Christ. Is it anxiety or worry? Be anxious for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Is it lust? You need to remember that lust, when it's conceived, brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And you need to tell yourself, I will not dwell there. I do not want spiritual death in my life. Is your strongest thoughts your past? I'm talking about life after Goliath. If you've deleted your, if you've defeated your, yeah, you can delete him too. If you've defeated your Goliath, your past is just that. It is your past. And the enemy would love to condemn you over your past. But there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Be a conqueror. Be more than a conqueror. Is it I'm a product of the way I was raised? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are gone. All things become new. I'm not that guy anymore, Brother Rodriguez. I'm not the same Evan I used to be. God came to set our mind free by giving us every tool we need right here in his word. 2 Peter 1, 3, and I got five minutes left, and I got to run. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. I'm telling you, God's divine power has given you everything you need to make it. And we'll wrap this up. David strengthened, he encouraged himself in the Lord, but their wives and their kids were still gone. Their possessions were still gone. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. That strengthening, that encouraging, he didn't just sit there. He, it stirred something up on the inside of him. And now it's time for action. And he said, men, we've been sitting here too long. I don't know about you, but I ain't going to sit here any longer. Time to move. Time for crying is over. God, what's my next move? And he called out on the Lord. And he said, hey, God, and I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to paraphrase. I'm going to try to get through this in a hurry. He said, God, if I go after, if I go after the Amalekites who took our wives and our kids, am I going to be able to recover what the enemy took from me? And God said, go after them. God said, pursue, and you will recover everything. I got to challenge somebody in this place today. Pursue, pursue, pursue. Hear what I'm telling you. You pursue the dream that God put in your spirit. Yeah, I'm talking about the dream you laid down because you didn't think it was possible to achieve. But if it is from God, you pursue that dream. It's time to go after the things the enemy stole from you. Verse 18 of chapter 30 says David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away and our musicians can come. I'm running behind this pulpit. My foot's going about a thousand miles away because I'm trying to hurry. But David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away and he rescued his wives. 19, nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons, or daughters, spoil, or anything they had taken from them. David recovered all. There's a point in this story where David went to the priest Ahimelech and he asked him for a sword. I told you a while ago he got Goliath's sword. The very sword that he took off Goliath when he killed him. The very sword he used to cut the head of his Goliath off. I just got this sneaky suspicion that the sword David used, the sword that David used to cut or to, to defeat the Amalekites and recover all was that same sword. You can go back to your story. We are made overcomers through the blood of the Lamb and our testimony. 
I got a testimony that I can't lay down. But that testimony, Brother Don, that testimony allows me to reach others who are captive, who are bound in the areas I was bound in. That story, some of you need to pick your sword back up. Some of you have forgotten your Goliath. Some of you have allowed the enemy to, to come in and rob you blind. And you laid your sword down. You've forgotten what it's like to experience victory. You've lost your joy. I'll never forget Pastor Zuniga coming to me several years ago and said, Man, Brother Miller, you need to lose, you need to get your joy back. And it was after I had defeated the Goliath of pornography and sexual brokenness in my life. But I struggled for a long time with shame from my past. Goliath was dead. His head was gone. But kind of like a snake, you cut the head off a snake and the body still squirms. It'll wrap itself around a stick. It'll wrap itself around your arm, even without a head. I had killed my Goliath, but I was allowing the body of that snake to wrap itself around my heart. I was allowing shame to suffocate me. And I had allowed the enemy to steal my joy. But I'll never forget, I'll never forget the night God lifted that from me. I will never, it was literally like, I, honest to God, I literally felt a literal weight lift off my shoulders when God removed that shame. You think I could stand up here and talk about it if it wasn't the case? I picked my sword back up. I pursued, I went after the enemy, and I recovered the joy and the peace and the anointing and the consecration and the ministry. And I understand things about God today that I never understood before. I love truth. I love truth. I love the Word of God. Who am I preaching to? Stand with me because I got I to stop. I got to stop. Some of you need to step out in the aisle right now. Some of you, I don't, forget a, a formal altar call. Some of y'all need to step out in the aisle right now and you need to declare, I'm going to get my stuff back. Come on.